we're finished. Should I do that? Yes. Yeah, I think so, right? We will definitely do it. So a poll just came out. USA, as you know, the USA Suffolk, which is a highly respected poll. And we are doing great. We're up by 10 points over everybody else. And uh, it's just incredible. And I think we might even be even better than that. But who knows, right? Even if we win by one point, that's OK. Not so bad. But let's win by a lot. But we're way up. Another one, morning consult. We're at 36. Ben is at 12. Carl is at 10. Marco is at 9. And Ted Cruz is at 7. So that's pretty good, right? We're 36 to 12. Reuters is 31 to 14 to 8 for Jeb. Oh, Jeb got in there. Good. <laughs> and Mike Huckabee, good guy, is at 7. So we're doing great there. You know the funny one, and I always say this, but it just sort of got finalized. I felt I did good in the debate, even though I was being asked too many questions, right? And the funny thing is, you know, for two hours, they're asking me question after question. Somebody said 47% were either to me or about me. In other words, well, they'll ask somebody like one of the other candidates, Donald Trump is not a good person. What do you think about it? I'm standing there like this. And then in the final 45 minutes, they couldn't ask me any questions because they asked me so many. It was embarrassing. I even apologized that I'm the one not doing it. And they said, Donald Trump decided to take off in the last part of the, and I'm saying, first of all, they made it from two hours to three hours, which is ridiculous. But they say Donald Trump took off. They didn't ask me any questions. I said, wait a minute. I don't want to be rude. I don't want to interrupt other people, especially since I've done it. So the polls just came out on the debate. And the Drudge poll, 680,000 votes. Drudge, which is an amazing, he's an amazing guy. And it's Donald Trump, 51%, he won. Carly at 23%, who did a good job, by the way. Marco at seven, and Ted Cruz at six. The Time Magazine, Paul. And Time Magazine, I have no influence over Time Magazine, even though I was on the cover last week, right? But Time Magazine has Trump winning, 55% for Trump, 20% for Carly, 7% for Marco Rubio, and I'm saying to myself, gee, I'm watching these shows, and they say Trump was okay, not great, maybe had an off night, I don't understand, I thought I did fine. And they were just trying to beat me up, Whew. But I thought we did good, and I think we're doing well, and the most important poll are like the one, the USA Suffolk, that just came out a couple of hours ago, that's fantastic. So I want to thank everybody in the room, and, and the other rooms that are filled up, who we'll see in a little while, but those, those people. <laughs> New Hampshire, I tell you what, it's an amazing place. It's a great, great state. It's a great state. A friend of mine from New York said, what are people from New Hampshire like? Can you believe these questions I get? I get, I'm being honest. What are they like? I said, I'll tell you what they're like. They're an amazing, they're just amazing people. They love the country. They love to work. Like me, I love the country, I love to work. We're all in the same boat. And we're gonna straighten it out, we're gonna make America great again, that I can tell you. We're gonna make it great again. You know, a thing came out, I was gonna save it for a little bit later. But you know, we made that horrible Iran deal. And I just wrote this down. I was watching one of the networks, and they said, we should have had the prisoners released, right? I mean, it's part of the deal. In fact, we should have made a deal on knocking the hell out of ISIS in Syria as part of the deal. There are a hundred things that we should have gotten. We're giving them $150 billion. We got nothing except defeat, because we don't win anymore as a country. We're going to win so much. We don't win anymore as a country. It's really embarrassing. So I actually tweeted this before. Do you believe this? Iran wants to trade our three prisoners. By the way, we have four prisoners. They're only talking about three. The fourth, they're not even talking about. So they want to trade our three prisoners for 19 prisoners held by the United States and many other things. I mean, how stupid are we? How stupid are we? And it's just going to change. It's going to change. It's just going to change. So embarrassing. 
uh, Bergdahl, Bergdahl. We get Bergdahl, they get five killers that they wanted so badly. You remember Bergdahl? He left, he left, he deserted. And we had five and probably six people killed going after him. And the other day I read for the first time, well, he wasn't feeling well, he may not be psychological. Who the hell cares? And they think he might get off with nothing. Six people died. Six people. And he was a deserter. Now, in the old days, when we were strong, what did we do with deserters? That's right. There was no deserting. You deserted, you had problems. He deserts, well, he's got psychological. You know, we'll let him off. He's a nice person, right? I don't think so. So, a lot of the press has been nice to us in the last few days because we gave a very detailed tax policy where we substantially reduced taxes. <laughs> very substantial. And I'm gonna go over it, but we're gonna create a lot of jobs. We're taking jobs back from China and all these other countries that have just been ripping us, ripping us, Mexico, China, Japan. We're gonna be taking them back. But you know, they were so happy in a certain way, they said, well, we want policy. So I gave policy on immigration, and they were sort of happy with that. They didn't necessarily agree with everything. A lot of people don't agree, build a wall. They say, you can't build a wall. How can you build a wall? It's gonna to be too expensive. Our trade deficit with Mexico is $45 billion a year. Don't forget, I said Mexico. I love Mexico, I love the Mexican people. I have thousands and thousands of Mexican people that have worked with me over the years. Thousands, I have a great relationship. But their leaders, I say it all the time, are too smart for our leaders, too cunning, too sharp. And they're ripping us. So we have a deficit. Nabisco's moving. Nabisco. What's more United States than Nabisco? They're moving to Mexico from Chicago. They're going to make Oreos in Mexico. Now think of it. And then we have Ford Motor Company. Two and a half billion dollar plant. You heard that story. I'm not going to tell it. Because if I do, they'll kill me. You know, I have all these live television sets. You know, every other candidate can go and make a speech. Every other candidate. And they make the same speech for months. But they have 100 people. For instance, Jeb Bush is down the road. They're expecting 125 people tonight. <laughs> no, it's true. Now, I'm going to tell you, because we have been getting amazing crowds. We had 20,000 people on Friday in Oklahoma. 20,000 people. In Oklahoma, a great place. That was an amazing event. We had 20,000 people. We filled up a stadium, a, you know, where the Mavericks play. Mark Cuban, good guy. And he has the Mavericks, and it's called American Airlines Center. That's in Dallas. 20,000 people showed up. Some were so far up, I said, can you even see me? And we had three days to do it, because when we got it, in fact, when they said, you know, you could have that arena if you want it, I said, when? Monday night. This was like Thursday. And I said, how can we fill it up? The first day they did 12,000 people. Then we went to Mobile, Alabama, as you know, just before that, we had 35,000 people. It's been amazing. So tonight, and I want accurate counts, because these people, they don't count heads. You know, they'll say, yeah, the place was okay. The press, they are so dis... By the way, pan out on these people, please. CNN and all of you live cameras, pan out. Because you know what they do? They have the camera, live television, on my face the entire amount. My wife goes, I go home, were there any people there tonight, darling? They don't see, they never show the crowds. They never show, they don't want to. They don't want to. And this room, we have another room just as big, CNN and all the people. But, you know, it's so important. So, the fire marshal, the only reason, because we have a lot of people can't even get in, 3,564. That's what we have, exactly. And we love the fire marshals, but the fire marshal actually, right over here, the fire marshal said, you can't have them in the aisles. 
No, it is a one-story building. If there's a problem, we get out of here. So I'll be the first one out the door, believe me. <laughs> but they don't want to have. So anyway, we have 3,564 people. We have closed circuit. It's amazing. It's great. And it's always like this, by the way. It's always like this. We did have one event so beautiful in South Carolina. I was called by a friend of mine who's African-American, a great guy. The South Carolina African-American Chamber of Commerce. He wrote the most beautiful letter tonight. I said I was going to read it to you. He put it in one of the papers. It was in one of the papers today. And there was a last minute thing that said, would you speak? And I liked it. I'm speaking to the African-American Chamber of Commerce, South Carolina. I went. And actually, they didn't come from the back. They just formed in the front. It was beautiful. And they, they said it was the biggest crowd, the best crowd they've ever had. It was such a beautiful day. It was a lunch. And it was wonderful. And the cameras, because they were all up front, the cameras showed chairs in the back that were empty. Like, oh, Trump's lost it. Is Trump losing? And I just walked in and did him a favor. And these people were so angry at the way they were to African-American people that do such a great job. And you have to see the letter. Anybody wants it, we have them, because it's, it was such a beautiful letter and so unfair the way they were treated and the event was treated. And that's why when I go to things like this, I like to have the press see what's going on, because there is a movement going on. This is more than like, oh, gee whiz, people show up. When Bush has 125 people and when Rubio comes in and you have 12 people, it's true. And when all of the other ones, I don't want to say about everybody, because some of them I really like. But nobody has crowds like us. Nobody. Including Bernie, who get, does pretty well. No, nobody. And, and the fact is, something's happening. Something incredible is happening. So what's gone on is we put in policy on immigration, and that's build a wall. People have to come into the country legally, have to do it, have to do it, have to do it, or we don't have a country. The anchor babies, we, we're going to have to do something there. And by the way, when I first brought that up, you know, people come in, they're in the other side, they're on the other side of the border. They have a baby, they walk across the border because nobody stops anybody. You know, it's like we're open territory. The woman has a baby on our land in the United States. Now we have to take care of that baby for 85 years. That baby becomes a citizen. And I said, it can't be. And everybody said, oh no, that baby is a citizen born in the United States, born on our land. Turned out I'm right. Because they're not coming in legally. And if you read the language, other than some, some television scholars that said, no, no, the baby's ours. We have to take care of the baby forever. People are coming from China. They're coming from all over Asia. They're coming from Latin America, South America. They're coming from Mexico. They walk across the border. It's ours. It doesn't read that way. And I didn't think. You know, they said, oh, you have to go through a whole big thing. Every state has to go to referendums. It's the 14th Amendment and so many different things, right? But it's not, it's not working that way. It's wrong. And I turned out to be right. Because the real scholars said, he's right. Now, maybe it's going to be. No, no, it's right. How can it be wrong? So this is something that's come up. We have to get rid of these sanctuary cities. It's, it's disgraceful. It's disgraceful. Because I've had so many friends that I've, I've made. Uh, first of all, you know, Kate, magnificent Kate, shot in the back by and killed in San Francisco, sanctuary city. Can you believe it? I have property in San Francisco. I own a big chunk of the Bank of America building. Can you believe it? I just feel, I feel, when I hear San Francisco, I always felt so good. Now you learn about sanctuary cities. The state of Florida had sanctuary cities while Jeb Bush was governor. Nobody said anything. And you know, I've gotten very friendly, very, very friendly with a lot of the people because I've become, it's become a very important issue for me the whole thing with illegal immigration and crime. It, it's far worse than anybody in this room understands. Far worse. Far worse. Tremendous people come in. But you have some terrible, terrible problem. Terrible problem. The other week, as you saw, got a lot of press. 
a woman, 66-year-old veteran, raped, sodomized, and killed by an illegal immigrant. Just came in, killed her. 66-year-old veteran killed her. And that's happening all over. We're going to stop it. We're going to stop it. We're going to have a wall. And I'm really good at walls, believe me. What I do, great. I build what I do better than anyone. That's why with the infrastructure of the country, it's falling apart. We're spending money all over the world. We don't even know where we're spending money. I was going to bring up today, they have a list of some of the dumb things that the country does. One of them was a washer. You know what a washer is? That's where the screw, you pop the washer, get a little extra grip. So it was a two cent washer. And by the time it went from, I think it was South Carolina to Texas, it was this circuitous route. It costs $988,000 to have it delivered over a long period of time. There's so many things like that. There are so many things. There are item after item, hammers that you buy for seven, eight dollars, selling for thousands, that we buy as a country for thousands of dollars. Some people are getting really rich. Who are these people that are making these deals? You're probably saying, maybe I do too. We want a part of these companies, right? Well, I want a piece of it. But where they're selling things that sell in a store for pennies, they're selling them for thousands of dollars. There's so much fat, so much fat. And I get a lot of credit for coming out with immigration. Some people don't agree. They think it's harsh. Some people think it's great. You know, Dwight Eisenhower was a wonderful general and a respected president. And he moved a million people out of the country. Nobody said anything about it. When Trump does it, it's like, oh. When Eisenhower does oh, it's fine. Well, that was he was allowed to do it. You know, we can't do it. That was also in the 50s. Remember that. Different time. That's when we had a country. That's when we had a country. That's when we had borders. You know, without borders, you don't have a country, essentially. We don't have a country. We, without borders, you just don't have it. But Dwight Eisenhower, there's big reports. And they used to take him out and put them on the other side of the border. Say, you have to stay here. And they'd come right back. And they'd do it again and do it again. And then they said, wait a minute, this doesn't work. And they took him out and moved them all the way south. All the way. And they never came back again. Because it was too far. Amazing. And I'm not saying this in a joking way. I'm saying this is what happened. It wasn't working. They were coming right back. And then they literally, literally moved them all the way. And I have to tell you, a lot of the politicians, they never came back because it's too far. They would put them on boats and all the way down south. And that was it. But then a lot of things happened. And a lot of changes took place. And now we've become so politically correct as a country that we can't even walk we can't think properly. We can't do anything. Every time you say something, oh, that was not politically correct. It wasn't politically correct. Nobody respects women more than I do, we'll tell you. And I used, that's true. And I will do more. Thank you. It's true. My mother was the greatest person there was. But nobody respects women more than I do. And two weeks ago, I was making a speech. I said, I respect women. I cherish women. I do. I cherish women. And Hillary said, we don't want to be cherished. We want to be respected. I said, I said that. Yeah. I think you want to be cherished, too. It's better than respect. It's everything. You want to be respected. You want to be loved. You want to be cherished. You want to be everything. I think. Am I right, women, or wrong? I mean, you know. <laughs> and nobody cares more than I do. And I will tell you, women's health issues, where Jeb Bush recently said that he's not going to fund them. Then he said he misspoke. The word is misspoke. He misspoke. Can't misspeak. I mean, that's going to be so vital and so important. And we're going to take care of our women, but we're going to take care of our vets. We're going to take care of every. We're going to really take care of people. Because I know how to do it. We're going to bring jobs back into the country. We're going to become a rich country again. We're a poor country. We're a poor country. We're a debtor nation. We owe now 19 trillion. For a few months, I've been saying 18. Now it's up to 19. 
We owe China $1.5 trillion. Think of it. They take our jobs, they take our base, they take our money, and we owe them $1.5 trillion. How does that work? That's like a magic act. We owe Japan the exact same amount, $1.5 trillion. We owe them. They send millions of cars here. We pay for the cars. They no tax, no nothing. By the way, try doing business in Japan. I always say, how many Chevrolets do you think you're going to find in the middle of Tokyo? Maybe none? You think none? There might be none. We sell them beef, and they don't want it. Beef. And they don't want it. They send it back. The farmers don't want it. So we owe Japan $1.5 trillion. Think of it. They sell us all these cars. We owe them money on top of everything else. It's going to stop. It's going to stop so easy. It's so easy. We have to balance out. I went to my people this week, and I said, I want to know something. I want to know how much do we, in terms of balance of trade, how much are we behind the eight ball, the U.S. trade deficit with China, Japan, and Mexico? Well, China, it's almost $400 billion a year. $400 billion! Japan is almost $70 billion a year, and Mexico, $45. $45 billion. Then they say, oh, you can't get Mexico to pay for the wall. $5 billion. Believe me, I'll build bigger, better, stronger for half the price. Much less than half the price. No, no, much less than half the price. Because I know how to build. I know. It, it, I'll watch it myself. Oh, it's going to be so beautiful. It's going to work so well. It's going to work so well. You see the picture in the big magazine this weekend? I knew the magazine because I was on the cover. That's the only reason I read it. But they have a wall like probably eight or nine feet. And they have a ramp going up and another ramp going down. They have cars and trucks going over, taking drugs. So here's the deal. We get the drugs, they get the money. These trucks go right over the ramp, over the wall. Can't do that when the wall is higher than the ceiling. Or it's a long way down if they miss that ramp, I'll tell you. It's a long way. And I don't blame if people can get away with this stuff, let them get away with it. But we're going to make our country so strong and so beautiful. We're going to do it. So then I put in something on policy with regard to the Second Amendment. I'm a big Second Amendment person. And I, you've all seen it. And in two weeks, this is something that I've really gotten to know a lot about. We're going to take care of our vets. I'm going to put in a policy paper on the veterans and the Veterans Administration, and I know what to do. These guys, it's not even the money. We spend so much money, but we have all thieves, tremendous corruption. A few weeks ago on Wednesday, we had the longest wait in the history of the Veterans Administration. You're in a waiting room. They waited days to see a doctor. They're dying. You saw that. You saw the reports. Hard to believe. So many people are dying while they're waiting. They're dying. Things that can be taken care of with a pill, with a, a couple of visits, with maybe one visit, and they're dying. It's not going to happen anymore. Um, it's not going to happen anymore. So that's one I really look forward to. And that one is going to be, and I'll tell you just briefly, I mean, it's common sense. When they're waiting too long, they're going to go to a private doctor, a private hospital, public hospital, whatever the hell is in the city, we're going to pay the bill, and they're going to take care of these people, okay? We're going to take care of them. So, so, and that's so important to me. I mean, because some of the greatest people, I've, I've met some of the greatest people I've met on this trail. We call it the trail. Do you believe I'm a politician? I can't believe it. I'm so embarrassed. I, people say, you're a politician. I say, I hope not. But I guess in a certain way I am for a little while, and hopefully it works out, and we're going to do something that's going to be wonderful, and you're going to be very happy. So, good. Go ahead. You can go ahead. You know, it's funny. A few weeks ago, I got a great story, and they said he's a great speaker, wonderful public speaker, but he has one problem. He speaks through the applause. And I never thought of it, and I realized they're right. People start applauding. I start speaking, and they immediately shut up. 
And I said, you know, but you know why? Because I'm so excited to tell you about the next thing. There's so many things we have to do. There's not enough time to wait for the applause. It's true. And I speak through the applause. And I think I'll keep doing it because it's exciting to me, right? Does that make sense? So I appreciated the article. And the guy's right, actually, but although I don't know. Who knows? So what I did is we came up with a really great tax plan that has been really praised, and in some cases not. They said it's too big. It's too big. We've got to put our country back to work. We have the highest taxes in the entire world, highest in the world. Our corporations are leaving our country because the taxes are too high. And I did a very sophisticated, very beautifully detailed policy paper. Now, a lot of the press would say, prior to that especially, and the Second Amendment, and frankly, immigration, they would say, oh, he talks well, but he doesn't talk well. You know, I went to great schools. I'm like a smart person. It's like, oh, he doesn't talk details. So all of a sudden, I'm speaking details. And even if they don't like the details, they appreciated that I gave them the details. I will tell you, uh, the tax plan is, I think, really something we're proud of. And I'm going to go over just quickly, because most of you have heard it. But it's going to help you. It's going to help in a lot of ways. Number one, it's going to help with jobs. It's going to help with jobs. It's going to put people to work. We're taking jobs back. We're going to have con we are going to have companies now come back into our country. We're going to have a lower tax rate than China. We're going to have a lower tax rate than many of these countries. You know what corporate inversion is? Corporate inversion is a disaster. Companies have billions, trillions, at least two and a half trillion total outside of the country. Everybody agrees the money should be allowed to come back in. Republicans, Democrats, this has been going on for years. They still can't agree. They agree, but they can't come to a conclusion. And if we bring that two and a half trillion, and I'll tell you, it's a bigger number than that. And if it is, my plan's even better. But I'm letting it come in for a very reasonable price, meaning a very reasonable tax. Right now, the tax is so high, you can't bring it. If anybody was running one of those companies, you can't get it in. They work on paperwork, and they can't get it in. Smart, they have the greatest lawyers, you can't get the money in. So I'm going to simplify it. I want the money to come in so that these companies, number one, don't go. You know what they do? A lot of them leave, you know this, in order to get the money. They actually move their company to Ireland, to other places in Europe, to other places in the world in order to get the money. And you have some big, incredible companies, big name companies, that are now thinking of leaving the United States to get the money and to get lower taxes. And there's really no way you can stop that. You can't say it's illegal because they'll find a way around it. The only thing that stops it is the marketplace. The marketplace is going to stop it. So we're going to take care of that. But we have, and I, I sort of titled it, tax reform that will make America great again. Today they said it's very Reagan-esque. I consider that a great compliment. One of the writers, one of the writers said that. And thank you. And I start off, too few Americans are working. Too many jobs are being shipped overseas. And too many middle-income families just cannot make ends meet. We all know it. And if it's not you, you know people where that's the case. My plan directly meets these challenges and the challenges also of business. We're going to make our businesses strong again. We're going to make them competitive again. And by the way, nothing to do with this, but we're going to get rid of the regulations that are mounting up like on a daily basis. It's ridiculous. Regulations are going to go the wayside. There will be some, but they'll be meaningful. There won't be the nonsense that every single day is happening. Every single day. The plan will provide major tax relief for middle income and most other Americans. Major tax relief. It'll totally simplify the tax code. We'll grow the American economy. And all of this will add up to a point where we're not going to be increasing our debt. If anything, if it really kicks in like I think it might, where the economy grows, we'll start reducing our debt and reducing it big league, which I want to do. And again, it's, it's, I know the people I'm running against, and I know Democrats, Republicans. 
they can't do this, folks. I'm really good at it. Who's better at debt than I am? Who's better? Is there anybody? I've had borrowing so big, and I worked out perfectly. The company's bigger, better, stronger than ever before. That's what you need. You need somebody with whatever the hell that is, whatever that craziness is up there. You need, you need that. You need that. You can't just be a politician, all talk, no action, they talk. They wouldn't know what to do with China. Carl Icahn, great entrepreneur. Everybody knows Carl Icahn. He came out yesterday. He said, Trump is the only one that knows what he's talking about. And he's great. And I'll get him involved. I'll say, Carl, you handle China. And you know what I'll do? Just walk away. Don't worry. We'll do very well. We'll do very well. We're going to come out great. We're not going to have a $400 billion deficit. That'll go away very rapidly. And we'll get along. China doesn't even like us. You know, these countries, they rip us off. They don't even like us. With me, I'll stop the ripoff, and they'll like us. Can you believe it? Hard to believe, but that's what will happen. So, in the plan, we're going to cut the individual rates from, and this is very important. Number one, we're cutting down from seven brackets to four, and the rates are going from 25 to 20 to 10 and to zero. When somebody's not making enough to live, what's the purpose of them doing lengthy returns going to get help from H&R Block, who we intend to put out of business because it's so, so ridiculous, so ridiculous. In order to pay us more, I mean, these people need help. They're not doing well. So what's the purpose? Plus the bookkeeping, it'll be a tremendous percentage. But, and, many, and some are not paying now anyway, but they have to go through this process. It's brutal. So we're going to simplify, but think of it. 25%, 20%, and 10%. And it's, that's a major reduction. Now, some people say it's too big a reduction. Some of the great geniuses that haven't made a dollar in their life, not a dollar, they haven't created one job. Well, I think it's too much. The only dollars they get is from their mouth. Then, if you're single and earn less than 25000 or married and jointly earn less than 50000 you will not pay any income tax, okay? You won't, if, if that's the way it is. What's the purpose? What is the purpose? We eliminate the marriage penalty, which is a killer for so many people. A killer. What's the purpose of that? And by the way, everyone agrees and they can't get it done. We eliminate the AMT, which is the alternative minimum tax. We eliminate it. We end the death tax. It's a double taxation. It's a double taxation. I mean, a lot of you, as an example, in New Hampshire, you have a store, you have a little building, you have a some. You leave it to your kids, the kids get a tax bill where they have to pay 35 and even 50% in estate taxes. Now they mortgage up the business. The bank ends up taking it over because they have to pay the estate taxes. And you've been paying taxes all the while. It's double taxation, and it has to end. So many businesses have been destroyed by the death tax or the estate tax, as people like to call it. But so many businesses. So it's very important. Our plan reduces and or totally eliminates most of the deductions and loopholes available to special interests, who, by the way, are supporting Bush and Rubio, and most of them, and Hillary, big league Hillary, big league Bush. You know, Bush is going to spend $100 million on ads. That money comes from friends of mine. They're friends. I know most, some are enemies. Some of them I don't like at all. Actually, many of them I don't like. But, <laughs> but when you see an ad, every time you see an ad from Rubio or Bush or Hillary, remember that money's coming from special interests and lobbyists. And when they want something done in a year from now, two years from now, if they ever get in, be sad. Won't that be sad? If Trump doesn't make it, won't that be a terrible thing? <laughs> but when that money gets spent on, you know, millions, 25 million, uh, Jeb today put in an order, I hear, 25 million for ads. Well, what do you do when you're weak on immigration and you're in favor of Common Core? How do you solve that problem with ads? I don't think you solve it. 
Rubio, the same thing. He's very, very, very weak on immigration. A member of the gang of eight, totally weak on immigration. How do you solve a problem when you say people can just pour in? Made a speech not so long ago in Spanish saying he wants to open up the borders, essentially. He didn't want you people hearing it, so he made the speech in Spanish. No, it's true. But he's very weak on illegal immigration. And I don't think, I'm not sure, I may be wrong, but whether you're Rubio or Bush, I have to tell you one, sir, do you mind? So Bush is the mentor of Rubio. And everybody said, this is politics at its lowest and worst. Oh, I can't stand these politicians, right? So Bush is the mentor. And he goes out, and he says, yes. And he pushed, and everybody said, Rubio will never run because it would be disrespectful to his mentor. And I understand that. It's called loyalty, right? I mean, that's sort of nice. Hello, folks. How are you? That's sort of nice, right? You know, you're loyal. I believe in that. So everyone said, Rubio will never run. The great genius pundits, they're on so Fox and CNN and MS. And they're all there. And, oh, no, he'll never run. He runs. They're all wrong. Very disloyal. It was disloyal. He's very young. He runs. And they ask Bush, what do you think of Rubio? Rubio comes out and he's talking about Bush and, you know. What do you think of Rubio? He's my dear friend. He's so wonderful. I love him so much. Then they ask Rubio, who's running against Bush? And he, you know, probably shouldn't be from a loyalty standpoint. The veterans know what I mean about loyalty, right? 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 So they ask Rubio, what do you think of Bush? Oh, he's my dear friend. Wonderful, just one. They hate each other. They hate. Trust me, I know. They hate so much. They hate more than anybody in this room hates their neighbor. Any. But it's political bullshit. Do you understand? It's true. It's true. So, let's go. So we're going to reduce or eliminate most of the deductions, loopholes available to special interests, and the very rich. Me. I don't like that. Maybe I'll change my mind on that one. I don't know. It's going to cost me a lot. While preserving charitable giving, which is important, and giving mortgage interest deductions, we want to leave the mortgage interest. You know, a couple of the plans, yeah, you got to have it. You know, a lot of people were worried about real estate. Try taking the mortgage, mortgage interest deduction out. You'll see what's going to happen to real estate. You want to see a crash? Try that one. So we end the current tax treatment of carried interest. It's a little complicated stuff, but the business folks know what that means. For speculative partnerships that do not grow businesses or create jobs and are not risking their own capital. That's what happens. They get this big thing. They're not risking their own capital. And it's a big number. Somebody said it's not so big. It's a big number, big number, but it's a big number up here. It's a big number psychologically, big, big number psychologically. So we have to do that. And a lot of the hedge fund guys, they're not happy with me right now. But the nice part, they didn't give me anything. They want to. You know, as soon as you go to number one, it's amazing how many guys call up, Don, I love you very much. I'd like to make a contribution. I don't want it. Am I making a mistake? I feel sort of like it's like, it's not natural to me. I'm turning down a lot of money, believe me. I hope it's appreciated someday. No, honestly. No, honestly. Because if I turn down tens of millions of dollars and I lose, I will feel so stupid. Really. I say, what didn't matter? So I hope it's appreciated. No business of any size from a Fortune 500 company to a mom and pop shop. How many people own a shop? Raise your hand. Great business, right? Okay. Well, you're in the same category now because the taxes are too high. Is that right? So no business of any size from a Fortune 500 company to a mom and pop shop to a freelancer. And you have a lot of them up in New Hampshire. Freelancers. Plenty of freelancers. Living from gig to gig will pay more than 15% of their business income in taxes. We're not going to take all the money away anymore. And people aren't going to create jobs if you do that. So we're going to have 
job, this is a job creator. This is real. This will be really dynamic. This will be something special. Now, a lot of people that don't know, they don't get it. But many people that do really get it. A one-time deemed repatriation, that's what I was talking about, all the money coming back in, of the corporate cash held overseas at a significantly discounted rate of 10%. In other words, they're bringing it over, we're going to tax them 10%, they're going to have the money in our country instead of having it overseas. <laughs> Tax rate of 10% and ends to the deferral of taxes on corporate income earned abroad. So that what you're going to do is you're going to have tremendous incentives for people even if they're doing business abroad. But you're going to bring the money back into the United States and they're going to put the money back to work even if they just give it out in dividends because the people getting the dividends are going to spend the money. And you're talking about trillions of dollars are over there. Trillions of dollars. And believe me, mark my words, I told you before, they say it's 2.5 trillion, I say it's much more than that. Nobody even knows. So corporate inversion, we're gonna stop and we're gonna have companies not leave. In the old days, people would leave New York and they'd go to Florida. Or they'd leave New Jersey, they'd go to Texas, where the taxes are low. Now, they leave the United States and they go to Ireland and they go to other countries where they have lower tax rates and other things. But with what I'm doing, they're not going to be leaving anymore. And we don't have to say, boom, you're staying. They're not going to leave anymore. So it really works. What we want to do now is reduce or eliminate many of the business loopholes because we're lowering the taxes so much that we can get rid of these tremendously complicated loopholes. And in the end, the business taxes are going to be lower than they were before substantially, but you're not going to have accountants where you have tax returns that go up to the ceiling if you have a business. It's going to be simple. It's going to be less taxes, and it's going to be simple. So we're going to be in a position to do some amazing things. And I've gotten just so many people are so thrilled with what I said about taxes. And I thought I'd review it for you. I, I did this the other day at Trump Tower. And we had a great turnout, and as I said, we had just amazing response. So let's talk a little bit about ISIS, and let's talk about our country. We spent, thank you, we spent so much money, so much money in the Middle East. Just spent trillions, just in Iraq, two trillion dollars, just in Iraq. Not to mention, even more importantly, the lives and the wounded warriors who I love who I love. These are the greatest of all. We don't take care of them properly, but these are the greatest of them all, the wounded warriors. So we have a president who doesn't know what he's doing. We have a president who looked like, remember he said they were the JV, that ISIS was the JV? Well, he looked like the JV last week when you compared him to Putin in New York, to JV. So now we have Putin, said I'm going into Syria, and I'm gonna knock the hell out of ISIS, he said. And I'm saying, what's so bad with that? You know, is there anything wrong? That's okay, it's all right. But I also say, we wanna be strong. We can't let him push us around. The problem we have is we have a president who is not respected by Putin just not respected. He leaves New York, leaves the United Nations. A couple of days later, he's got massive amounts of artillery and planes and everything else, all very quickly done. We would never act like that. We would never act like that. I saw one of your generals, I won't mention his name, one of your top generals the other day, active. They said, what do you do about ISIS? Can we win? That was the question. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Do you think General George Patton would say, I don't know? <laughs> Do you think he'd say that? I don't know. He'd smack the reporter in the face, kick him in the lips. He would give a smack to that guy. Or General Douglas MacArthur. The highest marks in the, I'm a big person for academia. I believe in it. The highest marks in the history of West Point, General 
MacArthur, a great general. Can you imagine him saying, I don't know what we do about it. These guys know. The good ones, they know. But we have people that don't know. Either they don't know or they're being so constrained by politics that they're afraid to say. But we have to be tough and we have to be smart. At the same time, I want to rebuild this country. We have bridges that are falling down. We have 60% of our bridges are in danger. 60%. We have roadways that are coming apart. We have airports that are third world. I mean, you go over to Qatar, you go over to Saudi Arabia, you go over to some of these countries, China, you see airports the likes of which you have never, ever seen before. And then you come back and you land at LaGuardia. It's true, potholes, potholes. You land at LaGuardia or Newark or LAX, and you walk into a filthy terminal that's falling apart with broken terraza floors. And that's what we have. We used to be the leader. We have to rebuild our own country. And you know, when you owe 19 trillion, and you want to take care of the vets, and you want to build up the military, because I will build up the military so big, so strong. <laughs> Nobody's going to mess with us. Nobody. Nobody. Now, with that being said, but you have to know when to use it. You have to know when, right? I mean, you have to know when. So in 2004 and 2003, I said, don't go into Iraq. I didn't know that much about Iraq, but I knew this. Iraq and Iran are always fighting. And they're equals. They go 10 feet this way, they go 10 feet this way, then they use poison gas, or Saddam Hussein, who's terrible. Then the other side uses, but then they rest for a few years. Then they start fighting, nobody ever moves. Right? Is that right? So I said, I don't know if they have weapons of mass destruction, turned out to be false. But if they do, they're going to use it on Iran, okay? That was Iraq. But if you ruin one of those two powerful agents, the other one's going to take over, and it's going to be a disaster in the Middle East. You're going to have a totally destabilized Middle East. That was in Reuters 2004 in June or July. A big story. Trump opposed to doing it. Now, again, I'm the most militaristic person in this room. But you've got to know when to use it. It's like also, I said, well, wait a minute. Of all of these guys that blew up the World Trade Center, they all went back to Saudi Arabia, the families. They sent their families back a day early to Saudi Arabia. I said, but why are we going after Iraq right now? The families went back to Saudi Arabia. They didn't go back to Iraq. I think one might have. Nobody knows. We know nothing. We know nothing. We know nothing. But I said, you're going to destabilize the Middle East. So here's what happens. We totally wiped out Iraq, totally destabilized the Middle East, gave other people ideas that you can actually knock these things out. Iran, as you sit here tonight, is taking over Iraq, which, by the way, has one of the richest oil reserves in the world. Their oil is unbelievable in Iraq, underground, one of the biggest in the world. So they totally take over, and they're going to very soon. So we spend all this money, all these lives, all these wounded wars. We got nothing. We got nothing. Because we have stupid leadership. Now, if you know anything about the Soviet Union, if you want the real truth, the Soviet Union broke up because they spent so much money in Afghanistan. Okay? They spent so much money that they were going bust. And that's the primary reason, or certainly one of the primary reasons, that the Soviet Union broke up. The Afghanistanian people, great fighters, always have been known. I have a friend of mine, he's a big war historian, among the best fighters, Afghanistan. So the Soviet Union, so now we have the Soviet Union wants to go to Syria. And they want to knock the hell out of people. And we're fighting Assad, because Assad's our enemy, and we're fighting Syria. Now, Syria wants to fight Assad. Think of this. Just put it together. You know, a lot of people, I get a little credit. They say, oh, that's not really nice. What do you say? Give me a break. So you have ISIS that wants to take on Assad. So we're fighting ISIS, but we want to fight Assad. Why don't you let those two fight for a little while and take over the remnants? Right? I mean, I guarantee you that Assad is sitting back saying, that president is one of the dumbest human beings on Earth. It's true. 
So you have ISIS that wants to fight Assad, and ISIS can't because we're bombing them. We're not doing the job, but we're certainly, you know, hurting them. So they're not going after Assad. Now you have Russia and Iran. Now Iran became powerful because we gave them so much money, aside from the nuclear, which they will have, believe me. But we gave them $150 billion. So now they're feeling they're, they're going to be a terrorist all over the world. They have so much money. And to them, $150 billion, that's real money. With us, not the same. So now you have Iran and you have Russia on the side of Assad. But they both want, Russia does want ISIS out because they don't want them coming into Russia. They don't want them crossing borders and they don't want them coming into Russia. You have the migration because Syria is such a disaster. And now I hear we want to take in 200,000 Syrians, right? And they could be, listen, they could be ISIS. I don't know. Did you ever see a migration like that? They're all men. And they're all strong-looking guys. Did you see it? They're walking, and there's so many men, there aren't that many women. And I'm saying to myself, why aren't they fighting to save Syria? Why are they migrating all over Europe? Seriously. So now... Now you have this guy, Secretary Kerry, maybe the worst negotiator. I think he will go down as a worse Secretary of State than Hillary Clinton because of the deal. And she was terrible, but I think he's going to go down as worse because of this deal. So now you have him saying, we're going to take in maybe, I mean, the number I'm hearing, it's inconceivable. You know, it started off with 10,000. The other day I heard 200,000. We're going to take in 200,000. Syrians or wherever they come from. We have no idea. There's no identification. There's no anything. And I'll tell you right now, and I'm putting everybody on notice, and hopefully this gets outside of this room, and I guess it will with all these crazy cameras going back there. I'm putting the people on notice that are coming here from Syria as part of this mass migration, that if I win, if I win, they're going back. They're going back. I'm telling you. They're going back. Because, you know, military tactics are very interesting. This could be one of the great tactical ploys of all time. A 200,000-man army, maybe. Or if you said 50,000, or 80,000, or 100,000, we got problems. And that could be possible. I don't know that it is, but it could be possible. So they're going back. They're going back. I'm just telling them. So if they come, that's great. And if I lose, I guess they're staying. But if I win, they're going back. And I know a lot of people would say, oh, that's not nice. We can't afford to be nice. We're taking care of the whole world. We're losing our shirts on everything we do. Everything we do. So tonight I'm doing a show on CNN at 10 o'clock. And the question was asked to me, why don't you give us policy, policy with respect to your attitudes on war in the Middle East. Why don't you tell us exactly what you're going to do in Syria, what you're going to do in Iraq? What? I said, I don't want to tell you. It sounds terrible. I really know a lot about it. I think, I think my biggest, I think other than jobs, everybody says, you know, CNN did a poll. I'm through the roof on jobs, through the roof on leadership, through the roof on almost everything, other than some people don't think I'm a nice person. I'm sort of low on that. But, you know, ultimately, I am a nice person. I love people. I want to help people. But, you know, thank you. You know. Actually, you know where I do my best favorables? In New Hampshire, Iowa, and South Carolina, because they got to know me. I'm here so much. Those are the places. So once I get out, I think people will find out. You know what? I just want to do the right thing. And I tell the story about a woman said, do you think you're nice enough to be? I said, I think it's going to be about competence this time. People are tired of being pushed around. They're tired of it. But I said to this person, nice person, Don Lemon, I said, Don, I want to be unpredictable. I had an article about not so long ago, a business article. And I beat some group of people. I love winning. Oh, I love it. <laughs> and I beat this group for something that everybody wants. I just beat them. And it turned out to be great. And one of my opponents, not in a bad way, but in a very respectful way, said, you know, the thing about Trump that's really hard, he's so damn unpredictable, we don't know what the hell he's going to do. 
And I said, I want to be unpredictable. I want to be. So when they ask me, and so does Patton, and so does MacArthur, and so does anybody that's smart. So when they ask me about, like, what do I want to do with Syria? I know what I want to do. Believe me, you're going to be happy. But I don't want to tell. I don't want them to say, oh, well, Trump's going to do this, so we'll do this. I want to be unpredictable. It's so important. It's so important. I mean, it just, we have to do it. Does, that, does everybody agree with me? And, and maybe if you're unpredictable, the stupid people are going to say, oh, well, he doesn't know that much. You know, hey, when Obama said, we're leaving Iraq on a certain date, now you understand, these Iraq soldiers, that comprised ISIS. These were guys that formed ISIS. These are tough cookies. They didn't like us, and they didn't really want to fight for Iraq because Iraq is a corrupt government, you know. Remember when they were handing $50 million of cash? Cash! They were going through Afghanistan, paying off. I want to know who are the soldiers that are carrying cash of $50 million? Cash! How stupid are we? I wouldn't be surprised. Those soldiers, I wouldn't be that surprised if the cash didn't get there. I have to be honest. Oy. But remember when Obama was saying, we will leave. We are leaving Iraq as of a certain date. Now, the opponents said, wow, that's great. What do we have to fight anymore for? Let's just wait a year and a half. That's what happened. And then as soon as we left, they knocked the shit out of everybody. Right? They just knocked the hell out of everybody. Obama, this great president of ours, we will leave. Remember, he gave a certain date. A date certain. We will be out. And these tough guys, these are tough fighters, especially when they have something they want to fight for. They didn't want to fight for a corrupt government. But he gave a certain date. So I want to be unpredictable, OK? I would never have given a date. I might have said, we're going to stay there for 20 years. We're going to stay there for eternity. And these other guys would say, oh, man, we give up. It's just we kids can't do this. No, honestly, they would have said it. We were doing fine. I mean, look, we shouldn't have been there. But we were doing OK toward the end. And then we took everybody out. But instead, if you would have said, no, no, we're going to be there forever. And I didn't want to go in. But I would have said, no, we're never leaving. We're never leaving. They would have said, OK, this guy's crazy. We're out of here. Don't we want that as a think, right? So, so I love the people of New Hampshire. I love you. I love the people of this country. And I didn't really want to do this. I, I did something. I have this. People actually thought I wouldn't run because they'd say, what? Why would he do this? It's hard, nasty. The press is horrible. Not all of it, but horrible. Uh, the, the, you know, it's hard. And they say, why would he do it? I do it because we have a chance to make this country greater than it's ever been before. I really believe that. <laughs> and if I didn't believe that, I wouldn't do it. I wouldn't do it. The one thing I will warn you about, I don't think we can go on like this much longer. I really don't. I think this election is so important, beyond important, because we cannot continue to go on like we're going on right now. We need a real leader. We want somebody that loves the country, truly loves the country, truly wants to make it work. And I can promise you this. I can promise you this. If I get elected president, we will indeed make America great again. That I can tell you. That I can tell you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, everybody. We love you all. Thank you. Thank you.